Hello there, everyone. Welcome to the AS Computer Science Component 1 live stream. This is our revision session. I'm just going to wait a few more minutes for people to get on. Hopefully, you can all hear me. And hopefully, this stream holds up. Now, please remember that you can always ask questions in the chat. If you've got any specific questions relating to what I'm going through, or if you want us to revise something else, please do stick it in the chat, and I'll try my best to get to it. I'll try and monitor that as I go through. But like I said, we'll just wait a couple of minutes for a few people to join us. Okay, people are coming through now. Two's complement and binary will be covered, yeah. So I think I should dive right in, really. So what we're going to cover today is all this stuff here. So for the question in the chat, Jake, that's for you, really. I'm just going to bring up my chat somewhere so I can see it. Okay. Hello, Max. I've answered on behalf of YouTube there. So I just want to wait just a little bit longer. Just make sure people have got on there. Logical and arithmetic shifts, they may be on the test. Yeah. So what we're going to look at is these topics here. So this is our advanced information that we've got from the exam board. And only this year, because of the COVID pandemic, are we um, given this information, this um, content material. Now, please be advised, I will warn you here, that it says at the top there, the content is shown in the specification order and not in question order. So when you get your paper, this is the component one paper I'm talking about, you will get these topics, but not necessarily in this order. So content not included in this list may still be assessed in low tariff and synoptic questions. So it's important that you still continue your revision just as normal, but these are the areas that you really need to hit. And these are the ones that I'm going to focus on in this revision live stream. Everything recorded here will be timestamped and it will be available after, after this live stream. So... I'm John Barker, I'm from Oldham Six Farm College and I'm the course leader of computer science. You probably haven't seen me because I don't teach AS um, computer science this year. I only teach A2. Um, whether that changes next year, I don't know. It's not up to me. But here we are. So we've got hardware and communication and the amplification material. We're going to focus on the fetch, decode, execute cycle. Data transmission, which covers simplex, half duplex and full duplex transmission methods. We've got data representation, which is basically all of our binary, logical shifts, and that kind of thing. And we have also um, absolute relative errors in there as well that I'll throw in just for a bit of revision. And also we've got algorithms and programs. So that covers mainly parameters and parameter passing and programming constructs. So our three main programming constructs that we need to know. We have principles of programming. So describe the distinguishing features of different types of programming. So that covers procedural um, event-driven, 
We've got visual and markup languages. Now, the thing that's not covered in there is object-oriented, and I'll get to that further on um, because object-oriented is normally covered in programming paper, which is component two. Uh, we've got systems analysis, which specifies investigation and analysis in there. And then we've got the need for different types of software systems and their attributes. So looking at different types of software. So our three main different types of software and expert systems. If I go through anything too quick or don't explain anything well enough, please put it in the chat and I'll, uh, I'll, I'll let you know. So let's move on then. These are the key areas. Now, I'll send this out after to the students or I'll pass this on to your um, your actual teachers and they'll pass this on to you. This is basically all of the areas of computer science that we need to cover. So these are your 17 chapters in the computer science specification. And this presentation covers them all, although I've just extracted these yellow ones, the yellow highlight ones on there, because they're the ones that have been provided by the exam board that we must cover for our exam. So there are a few things, a few tips that I can give you here that will really help you in your exam. Things like binary data representation, that is always a good sort of bank of nine marks. That's normally the average number of marks for that for that section there, okay? So I would definitely make sure that you can cover the basics. If this was a regular paper um, where we haven't been told what topic's gonna be on there, we'd definitely be covering algorithms and pseudocoding. We'd definitely be covering data representation and binary systems. We definitely be covering Boolean algebra. Um, they are the bank. They are on every single paper that I've ever seen, and you need to hit those on a normal everyday paper. Okay. Now then, moving on. Then let's have a look. Then at our first one, we've got hardware and communication, focusing on the fetch, decode, execute cycle. Now, before we get into the fetch, decode, execute cycle, we need to be able to express the different parts of the fetch, decode, execute cycle. So the first thing we need to talk about is the central processing unit. So it's also called the microprocessor or just the processor. It will be referred to as the CPU in your exam and it is the brain of the computer. And its main role is to carry out all the mathematical and logical operations that you need that are given to it by the user. It's a, really, it's just a very complex adding machine. That's all it is, that's all a computer is. Um, and we use logic gates in order to manipulate data. That's it. And it, it really is that simple, but obviously, we layer it up, we've got a very complex architecture and it becomes very complicated nowadays with all our parallel processing and all that kind of thing. Uh, and yes, Nazim, um, this presentation will be available after the stream as well. So the CPU is one of the most expensive parts of a computer and upgrading it is quite expensive. However, it is one of the best upgrades that you can possibly do, okay? You students will normally go for upgrade of RAM and things like that, which is fine. But in order to actually really get the 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 performance you would invest in a new processor. So the processor and itself, the design is extremely complex. And if you look deep enough down into the CPU, it's actually made of um, silicon. So looking at it, they are incredibly complex to make nowadays because of the amount of manufacture that has to go into it. And that's what causes the cost. So the, the better the materials and the better in the improved design means that they are faster and more efficient. And I don't know how far we're going to go with design because we're pretty much sort of reaching um, limits here. But um, a processor gets made up of key component parts that you need to be able to refer to in your exam. Now, the processor itself can't just take binary and just work it out. It needs to be provided with software that's layered on top of that. And in your second year, you'll go more into this. But we have things like operating systems and we have high-level programming languages. And through that process, through the trickle-down process from a high level all the way to low level, which is machine code, we have something called translators. And what they do is they translate high-level programming languages like Python and Visual Basic and C and C++ and that kind of thing. And it breaks it down into, could be assembly language, but mainly it gets converted directly into machine code. And our translation systems, you'll learn about these next year, but we have compilers, interpreters, and assemblers. And their job is to translate what you write into machine code so that your processor can actually understand it. So these are the components. These will be very familiar to you. You've got the arithmetic logic unit, control unit, and registers. 
Okay, there are a few more in there as well because registers has a few more inside that that you need to know about. But we're going to go into that in just a second. So each component does a different job. And in this exam board specifically, we focus on um, the von Neumann architecture. So that is the von Neumann architecture there. Inside that grey box, you have the ALU registers and the control unit. Now, if you're asked to draw this, you must draw these specific shapes for this exam board. Um, and from those specific shapes, you need to be able to draw the buses, input and output devices. And then the green part there is memory. That is where we load information in and out. So that's our RAM. That's our main memory. Okay, apologies if I'm seeing your messages a little bit a little bit late here. Um, I'm just checking there. Do you need to know everything from the 17 chapters or just these? What are so mainly these? What are on this live stream? But they may ask low-level questions, small mark questions from any of the 17 chapters. That's why it's important to still do general revision. But these are the key areas that you need to hit on this live stream, and that's for Jake. Okay, so let's quickly recap some of these components then. We've got the arithmetic logic unit. Now, the arithmetic logic unit, the ALU, is responsible for calculations and logic operations. And when we talk about calculations, we're specifically talking about things like floating point multiplication, so multiplying floating point numbers or decimal numbers. We've got division, integer division. We have um, logic operations, so that could be while logic or that's iteration. And we've got comparison tests. So things like greater than or less than, less than or equal to, greater than or equal to, not equal to, and things like that. Um, but the ALU, it also helps with the input and output to and from the processor as well. And if you were to ever see um, a arithmetic logic unit and had a look at the design of that, it is incredibly complex. If you've done Boolean algebra before and looked at logic gates, if you do electronics or something like that, you may have to draw these. On some other exam boards, you have to draw the logic gates, and there's an example of some of the logic gates being drawn there with AND gates and OR gates and NOT gates and things like that. So remember, the ALU is all about calculations and it's all about logic operations. Our control unit, or the CU, is a key part of the processor. It plays a really important step in here because it manages the execution of machine code by sending control signals out to the rest of the computer. And the control signals are sent out on the control bus. Okay, it's the, it's the bus that is literally in charge of sending control signals to input and output devices or across to different hardware on your motherboard. So like I said, control signals are sent via the control bus to connected devices. So that could be hard drives, graphics cards, and a part of the, the, the control unit's job is to synchronize instructions by using the processor's internal clock. And that means that the faster your um, processor actually goes through a clock cycle, the more instructions or the more signals, control signals you can send out per clock cycle. Now remember, in our clock cycle, um, I'll just check there. Can just someone put in the chat? Can you actually? Uh, I'm, I'm pretty sure I'm answering your questions there. I might be pretty slow, but you can hear me, can't you? I'm just checking. Now, while someone answers that, I don't know if there's a delay on the chat, but I'll just carry on. So, remember uh, the clock, um, a, cl a pulse of a clock is the time it takes between two pulses of an oscillator. That's all. Okay, thanks, Jake. So our registers, when you get asked about registers, an exam question could specifically focus on registers because there's quite a lot of stuff in there. So a register is a small block of memory which is used as temporary storage for instructions as they're being processed. Now think about it, registers are stored on random access memory, and random access memory is volatile, which means when the power is switched off, you lose everything. Okay, it's temporary storage. Now the point of a register, uh, sorry, the point of random access memory um, and these, these registers is the fact that they run at the same speed as the processor. So think about it going round in circles. The processor spins round very, very, very quickly. And then what you need to do is you need to try and get onto the processor. 
if you try and jump directly onto the processor, I like to think of it as um, a roundabout in a playground. If someone's spinning that really fast and you try to get on, you're probably going to lose a kneecap. If, for example, though, you run around it at the same speed in which it's spinning, it's easier to step on and step off the roundabout. And that's the way my mind works when I think about the, the temporary storage passing data on and off the CPU. So the processor contains many registers. Some are reserved for specific purposes, so they're called special registers, and some are reserved for just general purpose calculations. And machine code instructions can only work if they are loaded into registers. So that's why often um, having lots of RAM is beneficial because you can load lots of things from secondary storage into RAM and then your CPU then doesn't have um, a break really or cr doesn't create a bottleneck because secondary storage retrieval is incredibly slow even if um, we're using secondary storage or solid state sorry should I say that could be M.2 or solid state memory um, question but there may be questions that won't be covered on this live but they are low stakes yes 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 they'll only be sort of small mark questions so general purpose registers are used as programs run to enable calculations to be made and can be used for any purpose the programmer or the compiler chooses. So remember a compiler is something that takes a high level language and converts it into machine code. Special purpose registers, they have a, re they have a real job to do. So special purpose registers are crucial to how the processor works and values are loaded in and out registers during the execution process. So here we go, our special purpose registers are our PC or our program counter. We have our MAR and our MDR, that's, that's our memory address register and the memory data register. And then we have our CIR, our current instruction register, and then we have our accumulator as well. Now, top tip for an exam is if you write program counter, obviously you don't write out program counter fully out every time because it takes too much time and it's a waste of time. What you do is you write program counter and put in brackets PC behind it and then just refer to it as PC or refer to it as MAR and MDR and CIR and ACC. But make sure you define it at least once so the examiner will absolutely be sure that you know what you're talking about. So each one of these then has a specific process. So the program counter, its job is to store the address of the next instruction that's going to be executed and it does it in order. And it keeps logical order of what you're trying to, to process. So programs need to be loaded into memory by the operating system. So without going too much into it, the operating system has a schedule. And the schedule is in order and it's a queue. So just think of it like a shopping queue. You stood at the supermarket, you stood at the queue, in the queue. If you're first in the queue, you're going to be first out the queue. And that's how it works. Okay, Unless something has a higher priority, things are kept in order by the program counter. So as memory is referenced using memory addresses, the start of any given program has a specific memory address. And the memory address is basically where it's stored on RAM, that's all. So it's not possible to know in advance where exactly in memory a program will be loaded because things are being swapped in and out of RAM all the time by the operating system. And obviously, more frequently used programs are going to remain in RAM. Less frequently used programs or instructions are not going to be held in RAM as much. And that should make sense to you. Obviously, our more most frequently um, executed instructions are going to be stored in cache memory because it's even faster than RAM. Now, the program counter, I like to think of it like this. The program counter keeps track. Now, every time that we take the program counter instruction and pass it to the memory address register, we increment the program counter by one. So it moves down to the next instruction. So each instruction of the program is assigned an address in memory. The program counter initially contains the address of the first instruction of the program and not the actual instruction itself. It only, it only points to the address. And then we, we send the memory address register to that address to actually find it. So as the process is ran, the instruction to which the, pro the program counter is pointing to is loaded in 
to the memory address register so that it can be fetched from memory into the processor. So in your head, what I want you to think about is the fetch decode execute cycle. We're using these registers to fetch our instruction. So from secondary storage, the program is brought into RAM. The program counter points to the first, the beginning instruction. Then we store in the program counter, it points to the actual memory address. We load that into the memory address register and it goes to then fetch the data. Once we find where it's stored, then we'll pass it over to the memory data register. So with the program counter, the value added to the program counter is calculated from the size of the instructions for the given instruction set. And what that means is if you look on the right hand side there, we can't store all the instructions in one mailbox in RAM. Sometimes instructions have to be split up because of the size. And in order for us to actually process an entire instruction, the whole, all the different little parts of the instruction have to be loaded first before we can actually crunch it. Now, sometimes there might be something of a higher priority and we might have to jump around and bring in different instructions. And I'll give you an example. So I'm now presenting something, a PowerPoint presentation to you, okay? Something on my computer might have a higher priority and need processing immediately. What will happen is the program counter will point to the most, the highest priority instruction and it will jump to a different instruction. Now all that will make more sense to you next year when you look at assembly language programming, but jumps are an, a natural thing in processing because in an ideal world we would process each um, instruction one by one in a sequential order in sequence but we don't live in an ideal world some of the things need processing sooner so we jump around and we process different things once we've finished processing something else we jump back to what we were previously processing however the more jumps you do the less efficient your system is. Will the program counter increment by one when it fetches part of an instruction and not a full one? Very good question, yes. It will increment even when it's um, fetched part of an instruction because it collects, let's say the instruction was broken down into three parts, it would point to part one, load that into the memory address register. As that's going to fetch it, it would increment by one to instruction two, and then it would put that in the memory address register while it goes and fetches it, and then it'd increment to instruction three while the memory address register goes and fetches it. So yes, does it in parts. Now the memory address register and memory data register, what, what is the difference between those two and what on earth are they doing? So currently running programs are stored in memory, which we know and it means that they must be loaded into registers. Now the memory address register and memory data register, their main role is for fetching. They have their two special registers and the memory address register and the memory data register pass information between themselves. And obviously the memory address register contains the address of the instruction because it's called MAR. And the fetch instruction or data is stored in the MDR. So when we go and find the information using the address, that's the job of the MAR. Take the address and go to the mailbox in RAM where it lives. Then the data itself gets stored in the MDR. Now the reason why we split that up is because if we had the MAR going to fetch the information, get the data and bring it back, then that MAR is out of action. So we split it up and the MDR just focuses on bringing the data and the MAR focuses on finding the data. Now the job of the MDR is to take the data and send it to the current instruction register for decoding. Now an exam question that I've seen pop up a little bit sly is talking about what happens while one instruction 
is being executed. So once we've given the data over and it started to be decoded and executed, what happens? Does the fetch side just stop and wait? No, it doesn't. It goes and starts fetching the next one. And that's trying to be efficient. And that process where one instruction is being executed, another one is being fetched, that's called pipelining. Hello, Amir. Amir is one of our A2 students. Okay, so that is the fetch phase complete. Program counter, MAR, MDR. Now we're on to the de decode phase of the fetch decode execute cycle. And this involves the current instruction register. Once we've fetched the instruction, we copy it from the MDR into the CIR in order to understand what it's doing. Okay? So as the instruction in the current instruction register is being decoded and executed, the next one is being fetched by the memory data register. That's pipelining. And then any mathematical operations happen inside the accumulator. Even when the program counter increments by one, that happens in the accumulator. Because, for example, the program count will be pointing at instruction one. It needs to now point at the next one, which is um, instruction number two. So it has to send the actual number value of one to the accumulator and it increments it by one and sends it back. So any instructions that perform a calculation, such as adding one to one, incrementing by one, plus adding one to it, is done in the accumulator. It definitely earns its money, the accumulator. So calculations take a step-by-step -step approach, so the result of the last calculation is a part of the next. So the accumulator actually keeps a running total as well. And that's very important in a processor, especially when it gets more complicated when we get to parallel processing. And multi-core systems. So in certain computer systems, an instruction set may use the accumulator as a part of the calculation. So just know that it's always holding a value. So for example, on the right hand side there, the initial value is zero. We add four to it, it becomes four. We add two, it takes what's already in the accumulator and adds two to it to become six. And then we subtract one, it becomes five. Very simple assembly language there. Yep, the accumulator is a special purpose register. No, general purpose ones are just general registers. Your PC, MAR, MDR, ACC, CIR, um, they are all special registers. Now those, those are all our registers. And one thing that I want to talk about that catches students out that I've seen over the past six years I've been teaching anyway, um, is buses. Does anyone know the three types of buses that are going on? Feel free to whack it in the chat. We've got three types of buses. A little bit of user interaction here. Do that while I take a sip of tea. Anyone know? I don't want people putting first buses and stuff like that. That's, that's not what I meant. Not quite control. Or cob and troll. Control data and address. Okay, good. Excellent. So we've got address buses, data buses, control. So first, the address bus, its job is to transmit addresses in RAM, in, ma in main memory. So transmit the address of the next line of program code to be fetched. It also transmits the address of RAM locations or input and output ports where data is to be stored or loaded. So it's just sending addresses back and forward from RAM 
or the control unit will use it to send out signals, information to input or output devices or different ports around your system. Now, if you don't know about ports, um, if you give that a Google because there's lots of different ports on your computer. Some are vulnerable to attack. Uh, and what they do is th they handle like your monitor, for example, your internet, port 80, that kind of thing. So, you, you could, yeah, yeah, check those. So, you've got the data bus as well. Obviously, if address buses is dealing with addresses, then data bus does something very similar. It transfers program code between main memory and RAM and the processor. And it transfers data between the processor and RAM memory or input and output ports. So its job is really to get data from RAM into the processor. Addresses is all about where it's stored in RAM. And then we've got the control bus itself. So control bus sends control signals from the processor. So when, when it's been processed, decoded and executed, it sends the control signals um, around or t takes that information, whatever it needs to do, from the processor to main memory or input and output devices, ports to initiate data transfer. And that might be requesting more data from secondary storage, requesting a user input, for example, or sending information out to your screen, that kind of stuff. So make sure you know the difference. I'll give you a clue. The, the name of the bus gives it away. So we've got address buses, data, and control. Remember, when we're talking about control, because it's one that most students get wrong, remember control signals, control unit, control bus. They're all linked by control. Now, something that you'll learn a little bit later on when we get to, uh, well, if you make it into the second year and you get me as a teacher, I'll probably be teaching you about operating systems. Now, operating systems can generate something called interrupts or interrupt service routines. And they basically tell the processor to stop processing and process something else. So that last one, that last uh, bullet point, isn't expected from you really at AS. However, it will still be credited in mark schemes but it carries interrupt signals to the processor to indicate that a hardware or software requires attention. Can you keep this on for a bit, please? Which one? Yeah. You'll still get all this emailed out to you by your teacher. So feel free to pause it and go back a little bit later on. Now, one thing that I've created that really does help students, it's a fantastic revision resource, if I do say so myself, um, is this bit here. Let me just get a pen. Now, one thing, one way that I learned how to do this was I know that I'm dealing with PC, MAR, MDR, CIR, and CU. Okay, I know I'm dealing with those registers, so how do they interact with each other? Well, the first thing is that the contents, the program counter, passes the information over to the memory address register. Memory address register passes the data over, or pass the address where the data needs to be collected from, to the memory data register. Okay, at that point, as soon as, sometimes, this step 3A here, People, you could argue that it's done here as well, all right? It doesn't really matter where you say this happens as long as you actually say that the program counter increments by one because that will get you a mark in an exam. So as soon as the program counter passes its data over, you could increment the program counter by one if you wanted to. So it could go in between step one and two. Okay, so PC MAR, MAR MDR, program counter equals program counter plus one to increment that. And then the data gets passed to the current instruction register, and this is the decode phase. Once the CIR understands what the instructions are and what it needs to do, it will execute it and pass it over to the CU to send the control signals to wherever it needs to go. 
And in between here, yeah, the accumulator is doing its thing. If it needs to carry out an arithmetic or logic operation, the accumulator will help with that. All right. So the way I would, the way I would, would revise it, I had, I, I used to have flashcards, uh, and I used to do pro. Um, what did I do? I did program counter to MAR, program counter, program counter plus one, MAR, MDR, MDR, CIR, and then CIR control unit CU, okay? And that was all I had on a flashcard. And I used to just look at it and try and explain what was going on there. So I tried to just verbalize what was happening to the data and the instructions and that sort of thing. You might have a different way of learning it. That was just how I did it. So your teacher might have given you that, might have printed that out and give it to you. They may not have done, but there it is anyway. Okay. Now, if I put that on the screen, something should come to your mind. Now, I'm touching on this, but it's not explicitly covered on what the exam board have told us. But that thing in the top corner there, that is a bottleneck. How do we fix that? You need to talk about cache memory. Now, a bottleneck occurs when your secondary storage device is too slow and your processor is too quick and it processes lots of information and it basically bleeds RAM dry and there's nothing left in RAM. It's waiting for more instructions to be loaded so it can process it really quick. So normally, this happens when you've got things like um, a magnetic tape, um, a hard disk drive, an old school hard disk drive, and for example, an unbelievable brand new processor of today's standards. Okay, your processor will go, give me all the info, give me all the info, and it'll take it all very quick. And while that's happening, your secondary storage cannot keep up. So you get a bottleneck, and your processor sits idle, and that's one of the worst things that can happen. All right? So you know, between these two, in all in all, your RAM is going to be slower. Main memory runs slower than the processor. And you can update it. You can speed up your, sec your, your, your main memory. You can get cache memory, etc. But your pro you don't want your processor sitting, waiting idle and wasting clock cycles. The processor should always, always be working all the time. So there we go. As I said before, the speed of a computer processor or CPU is determined by the clock cycle, which is the amount of time between two pulses of an oscillator. And that is an exam definition. It's worth one mark. The higher number of pulses that you can generate, the faster the processor will be able to process information in the end. Okay. Now, if people request it, we can have a look at some at uh, this exam question a little bit later on. Um, but we have been through buses. I'm keen to get onto some uh, some binary things. But people can hang around and request that at the end if they wish. That exam question. And we've got the mark scheme in there as well. So we've got a lot to get through, so we'll just keep powering on. So if you do want... If you have any specific requests and you want exam questions, then please put it in the chat. I'm more than happy to go back and visit these a little bit later on. A topic that students tend to score very highly in is data transmission focused specifically on simplex, duplex, and full duplex transmission methods. So, three types of transmission methods that we use to transmit data over a transmission medium. When I say a transmission medium, I'm talking about wires. It could be uh, optical cables, things like that. Um, and it can even be wirelessly. So when a network is set up, what we need to do is we need to decide on how the data will be transmitted between computers. And we have to both agree. Party A and party B have to both agree. And you might be thinking, okay, we agree by talking about um, 
protocols. Okay? Yes, we do. We have to agree on our protocols in depending on what we're sending. But what we also need to do is we need to decide what duplex modes as well. Okay, so not only do we look at protocols, we look at duplex modes. And one thing I will say is uh, protocols could be low tariff questions. They're normally one to two marks. State the definition and explain what that is, two marks. However, we're focusing on duplex modes here. So let's have a look at the three main duplex modes that we've got. In exam questions, normally the duplex modes come up and you need to be able to explain them. You also need to be able to provide a real world example of where these duplex modes are used. So this is something from the textbook, full duplex. Full duplex modes mean, means that data can travel in both directions, both directions at the same time. So it doesn't matter what's being transmitted, it can also receive on the same cable. Half duplex, data can travel in both directions, but only one at a time. Now, if you look at that diagram there, one at a time, this here would be wire one, and this would be wire two. Okay, if you wanted to do one at a time, you could have one wire, but you would only be able to send information down. And until you stop sending, you couldn't send anything back. And this takes me back to my childhood. And this is dial-up internet I'm thinking of. When you used to sit there and send information down the transmission medium. And if somebody tried to pick up the phone and call somebody else, it would scramble. It would just make a weird noise on the phone line. Okay. Now, that's not the only reason why it was half duplex. Um, it was also a serial connection as well, but it was a nightmare nonetheless. Simplex. Data can only travel in one direction. What a great band they were. I'm joking. Okay. So, simplex. Data can travel in only one direction. So, let's have a look at some real-world examples. Simplex. Send data in only one direction. No packets are allowed to be returned. And then finally, we've got our example. Satellite TVs, they use simplex mode because they just send information to your dish. You don't, you don't send anything back, okay? You just receive pictures, that's it. And they move and sound, okay? Um, also, in addition to that as well, you could also have the example of um, just speakers, speaker. I've seen that in an exam before. So just I'm talk, just talking your standard PC speakers. Look at that diagram. There you go. Look at that. I'm an artist. All right. So nice and simple, nice and straightforward. We receive one direction only. Our full duplex mode, make use of separate wires inside the cable. So think about a cable that has multiple wires in it. Think about that. You've all used them before, I'm, I guarantee it. And I'm, you should be thinking of a twisted pair cable. Twisted pair cable, Ethernet. Or some people say Ethernet. Whatever you, whatever you call it. Okay, twisted pair cable has multiple wires in it, and you've got Cat5, Cat5e, Cat6 now, I'd probably a Cat7 somewhere. You could have two pairs, one for uploading and two for downloading. Okay, so two pairs for uploading, sorry, and two pairs for downloading. That way, packets travel in opposite directions, don't interfere with each other. So if you've ever made your own custom Ethernet cables, which is perfectly acceptable to do, I make my own, um, you would use these, one to send, one to receive, one to send, one to receive, one to send, one to receive. You get the point, yeah? Which is fine. You could set it up like that. Now, the reason why we use separate cables is because um, you notice this sheathing, sheathing, on here, this plastic material, and also inside here as well, you might notice sometimes there's a bit of a foil protector in there, 
Okay, that and these cables and that protector there is to stop the copper touching each other because that would cause electromagnetic interference, okay? And that is not good for your bits at all, all right? So that's full duplex. And I thought I was talking about half duplex, okay? So there's me talking on about all this stuff, okay? In full duplex, just not to confuse you, full duplex, they both travel in the same direction. There was me getting carried away, both directions. Okay, they still could be used back and forward like that, no problem. But in full duplex, you're sending information back and forward down cables. So you normally just reverse the polarity. So that cable could be used for sending and receiving, sending and receiving. Sorry about that, don't get confused. Half duplex um, makes use full use of all the cables when transmitting data, but can flow can switch direction based on communication needed. So as packets can travel in either direction along the same line, sometimes there are collisions. One second, one second, one second. Yeah, yep, yeah, yep, yeah, yep, yeah, yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. Okay, I know what I've done. Yeah, okay, that's fine. Just checking I'm not going mad, that's all. Okay, half duplex, full use of the cables, but you switch the directions on the cables based on what you need. So they can travel in either direction, but one at a time. So if I'm sending information down this wire, like this, and I reverse this at the other end, what happens is you get a collision in between. Now, please, whenever you're defining a collision, what is that? Please don't say it's when the data touches itself or it crashes or it physically doesn't touch, okay? All it means is when two bits are detected on the same transmission medium at one time, all right? They don't have to touch. As soon as we detect that there may be a collision, we disregard the packets of data, we disregard the bits, and we retransmit, we send it again. Okay? So when this happens, the data is lost and it must be sent again. Now with, um, with these three duplex modes, you can do something called multiplexing as well. Hopefully you've heard of that before. So multiplexing is when data transmission can be combined. Now multiplexing is a method where several independent data sources or several independent cables are combined and sent along a single route to a single destination. And you sometimes get this when you um, sort of mix copper cables and optical fiber so think about your house and how it's set up. You might get fiber to the cabinet, the green cabinet outside your house or on your road. And then from the cabinet, you might have copper cables. So what happens is you have to combine all the data and then sort of take it all apart again. So with that, several data streams can be combined and transmitted over the same wire. And think about why that's beneficial. If we are combining several data streams into one wire, we're saving lots of wires. Think of the money that these internet service providers are saving. It's incredible. Um, yes, walkie-talkies are an example of half duplex. Indeed, yes, they are. Now then, show you an example of multiplex in here. Now, this is multiplexing. Ignore the frequencies. They, may, they mean absolutely nothing. Don't need those. However, what you would do is you would take um, transmission line one, transmission line two, and three, and you would multiplex it, multiplex it. You combine it onto one channel, um, and then you would send it down, and then when it gets to the end, or the green box, you then de 
multiplex it, demultiplex. Now I've seen that on exams and students are like, what the hell is that? We got multiplexing and demultiplexing, putting them all into one transmission medium, separating them all back off the transmission medium and it sends it to the right um, signals or the right outputs based on a little bit of nifty software. Okay. So multiplexing and demultiplexing. So if you look at something like this, define simplex, half duplex and full duplex transmission. Now that is only worth three marks. They could bump that up to six marks by asking for, um, for, for examples, okay? But I could literally get my three marks by just saying simplex is transmission, in one direction only. One mark, half duplex. Uh, I'll just put both directions. But only one at a time. And then we've got full duplex. both directions simultaneously. Okay, three marks, nice and simple. Explain what is meant by a data collision. Okay, the reason why I put this question here because people are terrible at it, right? Terrible. So firstly, three marks, what's a data collision? That's when two sets of data and the, are detected. Should It would be helpful if I actually learn how to spell. Detected on the transmission medium. the same time. It's actually a lot harder than it looks to actually write on these things. So that will get me one mark, I believe. Uh, describe what should happen when this occurs. So the network detects an error. I'll get you another mark. And then the computers, so the one on each end, waits, waits, and this is the key bit, a short random. Why is that random? Why did they wait a short random amount of time? Why is it random? Why is it random? Oh. Then it sends the data again. Um, can you refer to two data packets as two bits and still get credit? Um, if you're being asked specifically about transmission, I would stick to packets. I would. Yes, yes, yes. Stick to packets because they can be more than one bit. I'm thinking. I was talking like a serial sending bit after bit. But yeah, stick to uh, packets if possible.
Is it random so they don't send the data at the exact same time? Correct, yeah. Yeah, if they sent it at the exact same time, it would cause another collision. Duh. So, yeah, that, that's why. Well done, Matip. Matip. Almost static. Mm. Uh, to make sure there are different times they're waiting for. Well, yeah, it's more, it's more to do with the collision. That's all. All right. Uh, yep, yep. Oh, yeah, perfect. We got, yeah, so six marks. Now, data representation. A little bit of binary. Yep. That's right, almost static, whoever you are. Correct, correct, correct. Right. Firstly, a little bit of background. Um, I don't know what you know about binary, but what an unbelievable topic it is. Very, very easy to get full marks. If you are unsure about anything here, please just shout it out, okay? Because it can be, it can get well confusing. So let me just tell you what you sh you have to know for binary. You have to know what base ten is, what base two is, and what base sixteen is. Base ten is what we count as humans. Uh, base two is what computers count in with zeros and ones, and base sixteen is like a halfway house in between. So. You have to be able to convert between base 2, base 10, and base 16. You have to be able to represent positive and negative binary numbers. You have to be able to add and subtract binary numbers. You have to be able to um, use methods of negative binary numbers as well. You you have to uh, use floating point binary then. Okay, So floating point binary to display binary floating point real values. All right, so they're the things that you need to know. So let's go through them. Um, and I'm, I'm, apologies if I'm going to insult your intelligence here, but I have I don't know where I don't know what you know. So I'm going to have to start at the beginning. So I'll move I'll move through it quite quickly until people like start shouting at me. So we've got bits, bytes, and words. In your exam, you can be asked for definitions on these. So what the hell is a bit? What the hell is a byte? What's a nibble? And what's a word? So like there's nibble in there as well. So in order to allow processing of storage of a data on a computer system, you must be able to convert into binary because that's what computers work in. Binary, binary is, well, a bit is a binary digit. So it's zero or a one. Computers work like that, okay? So a bit is a zero or a one. A nibble is four bits. A byte is eight bits. And a word is 16 or above. So that's 16, 32, 64, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So, have you ever wondered why some software comes as a times 64 or a times 32-bit processor? Okay, if you've ever wondered that, that's because your processor in one clock cycle can crunch 32-bit numbers. If you've got a better processor, because you're posh and you've got a lot of dough, then you can crunch 64 bits, 64 bit numbers in one clock cycle. Pretty good. All right. So a word is a group of bits that can be manipulated by um, a single, uh, as a single unit by the CPU. Okay. The size of the word uh, is also known as the word length and it consists of anything from 16, 32, 64 or 128 bits. I'm pretty sure there's now another one after that, but... They're very expensive, them computers. So good luck buying one of those. If anyone's got one of those, um, let me know because you're a liar. Large word sizes can mean that computer systems can transfer and manipulate large groups of data um, or larger groups of data than a computer system with a smaller word size. It can just crunch more, bigger numbers, more numbers. And that means faster operation, believe it or not. Yeah, it's 256. It's 256 processors. Um I don't think there's anything over a thousand bits unless you live in China because they've got pretty good supercomputers over there. Now, all data within an electric computer is encoded using patterns of binary digits and they'll come in different word lengths. Okay, Numbers can be written using patterns of bits. Text gets encoded as patterns of bits. So one pattern for each letter in the text. And you might have heard of things to display text I wonder if you've heard of like ASCII. That's the S, by the way. ASCII 
or Unicode. Heard of those before? American Standard Character Information Interchange, I think that stands for. Um, yeah, Unicode has now taken over. But that is basically a method of demonstrating bits as letters. Images can be broken up into a grid of colored dots, and they get represented as bits. They get represented as hexadecimal first, and then into bits. So if you're into graphics, or you're into like colors and you know weird stuff like that, that all comes in hexadecimal. Sound can be encoded using patterns of bits as well when it gets digitized. All right. Now, sometimes you could get asked about this as well. And what you normally see is you see these um, internet service providers fobbing you off, right? Normal humans will say, oh, it's a thousand, it's a thousand um, megabytes make a gigabyte. 1,000 gigabytes make a terabyte, okay? Uh, 1,000 terabytes make a petabyte. Liars, absolute liars. We do this, we say it's a 1,000 because we are human. And it's easier to remember a 1,000 than remembering 1,024. It is actually 1,024. 1,024 um, bytes in a kilobyte. Or bits, should I say. I'm lying to you. Uh, megabytes, 1,024 in gigabyte. It is actually 1,024, and that's because we go up in base 2. Base 2, so if you half that, and you half it again, you half it again, you half it again, half it, and you get, you get all the way to 1. So, yeah. Does anyone know what that number? If anyone can say that number, I'll be well impressed. Good luck to you. What even is that? Who knows? But it's a lot of data, isn't it? It's a lot of bits, that. Someone's going to be brave and try and do that. So yeah, you need to know bytes, kilobytes, megabytes, gigabytes, terabytes, and petabytes. You don't have to go past that, but you just need to know that each one, it's 1,024 of the of the next one down. So if you've got gigabytes, it's 1,024 megabytes, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Okay. Um, right. So hexadecimal numbers. Hexadecimal base 16. base 16. Now the reason why we say base 16 is because um, we go up to 1 to 9. Now look at the difference. P oh, you know what? I, I absolutely hate students for this. What they'll do is they'll go that is the same as that You've got to really be careful on your exam questions because I have seen exam questions where they will try and catch you out. Base 10 is not the same as base 16. This is 11. This is 1-1. One, one. That might sound really stupid to you, but I have marked so many exam papers where people have got that wrong. It's actually incredible. Okay? Oh, my days, right? Yeah. Ridiculous. So this is uh, eleven would be would would actually be would actually be B when it comes to it. So if you look at this here, um, your hexadecimal goes all the way to nine. Then after nine, it goes from A to F because the maximum you can represent in hexadecimal is four bits, four bits maximum. And if you if you look at that one two four uh, eight. Four bits is the maximum you can get is 15 out of that. Okay, you got one eight bit, one four, one two, one. There you go. All right. That's 15 in total. So that's the highest number, the highest letter you can produce in hexadecimal. I'm just going to move on because I imagine people know this. Right, if you're converting denary to hex, uh, sorry, yeah, denary to binary to hex, you convert the denary number 31 in base 10 into hexadecimal. The first step you would do is convert it to an 8-bit binary number, okay? Then you split the 8-bit binary number into two 4-bit sections or four or two nibbles. And then what you do is you would change the heading of your first 4-bit section. So there you go. That's 8 bits represented there. It's 31 in using 8 bits. <coughs> you split it down. You change the headings. Look at the headings changed. Here, it's not 16 anymore. It's 1. It's not 32 anymore, it's 2. It's not 64, it's 4. It's not 20, It's not 128, it's 8. Yeah, so that would be 1, and that 
We add that up. And there we are. So that is all the ones which would be F. So that's one F. Hopefully you could see that. Why is that F? Because it's 8 plus 4 plus 2 plus 1. That's 15. 15 hexadecimal is F. All right. We're going to move on unless people tell me to stop. Representation of numbers as bit patterns. Binary can also be used to represent negative numbers. Somebody tell me the two methods of representing negative numbers in binary. Two methods of representing negative numbers in binary. Now, as people are doing that, you need to read the exam questions very carefully. Very, very carefully. Two's complement and sign and magnitude. Very, very good, right? We don't use sign and magnitude for anything else apart from just representing negative numbers. Two's complement is used for everything. It's used for addition, uh, sorry, addition of negative numbers. It's used for um, floating point values, etc. So let's have a look then. So sign and magnitude. Now, notation isn't used very as uh, very often. We use two's complement, okay? But the most significant bit becomes a sign bit. And that means because you're using a sign bit, you actually you reduce the size of the number. That is a negative, negative. Why do you reduce the size? Because now the range has increased. Yeah, the range, because you've got negative numbers now, but you've lost that end number. Also, another negative is there are two representations of zero. What are you talking about, John? What on earth are you talking about? There you go. There you go. How about that? What's this? Yeah, zero. Zero, 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 zero. What's that? That's zero, isn't it? Sign of magnitude. The most significant bit becomes a plus or a minus. What's that then? Oh, what? what? Negative zero. You can't, what? You can't have negative zero. It's just zero. You what? what? What does that mean? What is that? What is that? That is one of the biggest disadvantages there as well. So if you get asked, what are the disadvantages? There's a couple for you. There's a couple. Two representations of zero. What oh, stupid. Never heard of anything in my life. Okay. Oh, look. Now I've drawn all over it. Wonderful. Let me get rid of this stuff. Okay. So, you know, plus 127 to minus 127, that's a lot less than 255, okay? So it makes it harder to do calculations. Different bits mean different things. Some represent numbers, others represent signs. Your most significant bit in 8 bits, 16 bits, 32 bits, 64, it just becomes messy, just becomes messy. So what we do is we, this is our de facto, our default is two's complement. Okay, so this complement's much more useful because it allows you to use negative numbers without reducing the range. Okay, it allows you to use it without reducing the range. So the method is, there are two methods of two's complement, by the way. We normally teach one method because if we taught you two, they both do the same thing. A lot of students get confused with the second one. Okay, um, but this is, this is the main one that we teach. So firstly, convert a positive number into binary using the normal binary method. Then we start at the right-hand side. The right-hand side, we could have also said there, you start from the least significant bit and you go up to and including the first bit. Then you invert. Invert means flip. Flip all the other bits. Okay? So, for example, I don't know, let's take 1, 2, 4, 8, 16, 32, 64, 
128. Uh, let's do, let's represent minus 20. I keep it nice and simple for myself. Okay, that is positive 20. Right, you go up to and including the first one bit. So you copy them down and then you flip invert the rest. So whatever this is, we flip it. This is flip it. This is flip it. This is flip it. Right, and then that is now negative 20. How? How on earth is that negative 20? Because when it becomes 2's complement like this, this represents negative 128. So we take negative 128, we add it to 64, we add it to 32, we add it to 8, and we add it to 4. You do that, and it'll give you negative 20. Wonderful. It's all because of this last most significant bit becoming a negative number. All right? So when we ask you to add and subtract binary numbers, you need to make sure that you are using um, two's complement. So binary addition is dead straightforward because all you've got to do is remember these things here. So if I said to you, here's a number, one, two, four, eight, let's add six, and let's add four. Add them two together. Zero plus zero. Well, zero plus zero gives us zero. So that would be zero. One plus zero. One plus zero. It's this one. Gives us one. One and one. One and one. Here, one and one. Gives us one. Carry the zero. That is not ten. If you say ten, I will hunt you down. Okay, that is zero, carry the one over. If you don't put your carry bits on your exam, you will lose a mark. Do you want to lose a mark? I didn't think so. Zero plus zero plus one gives us one. Okay, so then when you look at it, that's eight plus two. That's ten in total, which is good, isn't it? Wonderful. So, so just stick to these operations, you must show your carry bits, people. You must show them. So binary subtraction is the same as binary addition, except you convert the number to be subtracted. You convert it into a negative number using two's complement before adding them together. So you don't actually, you don't actually subtract. You just add negative numbers. It's crazy, isn't it? There you go, a little bit of ASMR for you there. So let's, we'll, we'll, we'll do a few of these in a minute. So describe the nature and uses of floating point form. So let's talk about floating point form. What the hell is floating point form? Uh, floating point form, there you go. That's a floating point number. 100.25, that's a floating point number. Madness, isn't it? Madness. So representing numbers in floating point form it allows us a greater range of positive and negative numbers, a bigger range. It also can be more accurate as well. So it includes real numbers, that's floating point numbers, to be stored in the same number of bits. Okay, it's called floating point because the the, the, the point the decimal point there, okay, actually floats around in binary numbers. It moves along. That's why we call it floating point. Okay, We're at, we are given a fixed number of digits, but the floating point moves around. The only problem is we can represent a fixed point in binary. Zero or one cannot portray a, a decimal point, an actual decimal point. You can't draw it in a computer. So how do we do it? Well, some clever cookies uh, came up with the use of mantises and exponents. Okay. Now, feel free to comment here because this is normally where students get absolutely lost. All right. They this for some reason this is where people make most mistakes. This is where people struggle. If that's you, feel free to admit it. 
if you want to hide in shame, do so. But I'm going to show you how. So the mantissa shows you what the actual digits are for the number. It's the value of the number. Okay? So when you look at mantissa, think the value of the number. When you look at exponents, yeah, think about, I don't know, 14 to the power of something. That's an exponent, okay? It's to the power of something. And that tells you how many places to move the decimal point and in what direction, okay? You can actually have negative exponents as well, which is strange, but you'll never get that in your exam. You only get positive ones, so it moves it around. I'm not seeing any more comments in the chat, so I assume people are hiding their shame. Now stick to these rules, people. Both the mantissa and exponent are always twos complement numbers. Always. If I said to you, the exponent is represented using four bits, it would be one, two, four, and negative eight. Yeah, that is two's complement, four bits there. You could represent whatever numbers you wanted to. If you wanted to represent six in there, you just put zero, zero, one, one, zero, like that. That represents six, doesn't it? If you said represent five, you'd go, oh, okay. There you go, representing five. I have never seen a negative one before. Never. Never. Don't mean it can't happen. It's just not seen it. So the decimal point is there in the mantissa, but it's not actually represented using a bit. Okay? So if I said to you, oh, look, here is... One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Okay? The decimal point is actually there. But where does it go? It goes in its normalized position. That's where the decimal point lives there. It's just after... It's just after the first digit. Right? That is where it goes. By default, it's default. All these computer scientists, they agreed that that's where the normalized point goes all right decimal point oh there you go decimal point always goes between the first two left hand digits they're the first two left hand digits there that's where it goes all right okay so here we go then you'll be required to convert the real number into floating point form the following example uses an 8-bit signed mantissa. Signed because it's 2's complement. So we've got 8 bits. Ugh. Oh my goodness, stop it. Right, we've got 8 bits and 4 bits signed for the exponent. Okay, again, 2's complement. Yeah, it's signed. Don't, don't worry about that. Just ignore it. So here we go. Um, convert 5.625 into floating point form. So the size of the mantissa exponent can vary, so it's important that you read exam questions carefully and use the structure given. Correct. Sometimes they go, oh, you've got a, a you got a 16 bit signed exponent. Don't worry about that. Don't worry about that. In mantissa exponent questions, it mentions that the answer is in two's complement form, but when we get the final answer, we don't have to convert it into two's complement, do we? No, you do not. No. Are there practice questions? Yes, there are practice questions. We'll do some. All right. So I have a four-step method that works every single time. It has a 100% success rate if you follow it through. Okay. The four steps are as follows. Convert this number here into the smallest amount of bits. Okay. So we take a four, a one to give us the five. Decimal point, everything after decimal point, halves. Okay? So you've got 0 0.5, 0 0.25, 0 0.125. And we need 625. So we take one 0 0.5 and we take one 0 0.125. Add them together and that gets you 625. Okay? So step one, complete, convert into the smallest amount of bits. Job done. Next. You normalize the number by putting 0 point at the start. 
okay? Why is that a naught point? Because this is a positive number. Positive number, okay? Normalization. Remember, the point must go between the first two left-hand digits. It always goes in a zero point there, okay? Normalized form. And again, it's positive, so it just stays as zero. Next, step three, we pad on the right-hand side. How many times have I seen people pad on the left-hand side? I can't stress this enough. Okay, you must pad on the right. Do not pad on the left. So you pad it to the required number of bits in the question. So in the question, it said... The mantissa is an assigned 8-bit number. So there's my sign bit. I'll just put here, signed. That's 1, 2, 3, 4. Don't count the decimal point. 5, 6, 7. And we need 1, 0 to pad. Okay? If it said this is a 32-bit number, you just go 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, and you carry on. They do that just to scare you. It means nothing. Um, it's never gone lower than 0 0.0625, no. Not in a mantis or an exponent question, anyway. Sometimes you're asked to convert the... Um, sometimes you're asked to convert the number as you see it. So it will go below that number. But remember, you've got a calculator in your exam or you should take one with you and you can do it in your calculator. Just keep half in the number. All right. So we pad on the right hand side so it doesn't change the value of the number. Because if you put zeros here, what happens is everything shifts to the right. When you shift to the right, it halves every time. Okay. So all we have to do now in step four, is work out how many places we need to move our decimal point that was originally here over to the normalized position. And that's one, two, three places. So the exponent represents this number, three. And we take our four-bit exponent, that's signed, and we go one and take a two, and that makes three in total. So that is representing your exponent number of three, using a signed 4-bit number. With that, once you've got your number, that's your, that's your actual full answer there. You can leave the decimal points in if you want to, or you can take them out. You will still get full credit regardless. If you need to go backwards and reverse the process, the first thing we do is we convert the exponent so we know exponents the last four digits that represents three you go to your decimal point you go one two and three then you, once you've got your point in the right place you can go one two four and you can go 0 0.525125 and add up the numbers simple as that now if that's too quick for you we're going to do some exam questions in a minute. So something like this here, you need to reverse the process on. So the floating point number is not 11100000101. It's an example that uses six-bit sine mantises. So that's six-bit mantises. 6-bit exponents, it's 1, 2, and 4. This is the exponent at the back, so that's 4, 5, 6, so that's actually just 5, 5 in total. Decimal point is here in the normalized position. You go 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5. Put your decimal point there. 1, 2, 4, 8, 16. Add them together. And hey presto, you're done. So let me show you. 
four steps. If you're on your computer or you're on your phone, I would I would strongly suggest screenshotting this. If you've not been taught this, you need to know it. My four step method. You convert the number into binary in the shortest number of bits. Normalize by putting naught point whatever. It doesn't have to be a one. It could be naught point whatever. Just put a naught point at the front. Pad to the correct number of bits from the exam question. And then calculate the exponent in the given number of bits. Okay. Now, don't worry, we're going to come back to this and test this out. All right. There's a couple of things that I'm going to talk about now, additional to binary. You've got truncation and rounding. Now, truncation and rounding is something that you would have done in your life. Do you use it in maths all the time? So truncation is chopping, isn't it? Chopping. So truncation is a method for dealing with a situation where there is not enough bits to represent all of the numbers stored. And sometimes that happens. Because your um, word length of your processor might be smaller than what needs to be actually crunched. So the extra bits are simply left out or chopped off. For example, 0.0101101 would be stored in four bits as 0.010. That's because you're chopping all this off here. Chop it off. Truncation doesn't care about accuracy. It just chops it off. So the original number, if you converted that original number that I've just scribbled on, okay, you would actually get this here. This would be the deanery value of it in base 10. And once you convert this truncated number here, that would actually be 0 0.25. Look at the accuracy between the numbers. The accuracy is terrible. Okay. So what this means is an absolute error. Now you need to be able to calculate absolute errors. And all you do to calculate an absolute error, you take the original number, this one here, and you minus the truncated number, which is this one here. And that gives you your absolute error. So there's the original number, the truncated number, and it gives you this. This is the absolute error. Now, you might not have heard of absolute errors before, but I remember doing them in science when I was a young schoolboy. I remember that, absolute errors. And all this is doing, it's just determining how accurate things are. So we have a relative error as well. So you need to be able to calculate the relative error. And this is the percentage of error, really. So this is the raw value, and this is the percentage. So in order to calculate the relative error, you take the absolute error from here that you've just worked out, which is this one, and you divide it by the original number. So divide it by the original number. Ugh. And that will give you a percentage. There you go. So you can round that up to one decimal place, and that's your percentage. Okay, multiply it by 100 and then truncate the rest. Yep, that does have something to do with Python. What's interesting, I'd like to know which Python version you're using because I know there was a lot of discussion on different Python versions as to how different information is populated. Such as that. That is, that is a very strange error. Now, if you take truncation and how, just remember 28.9%. Remember that, because that's how inaccurate this is. 
let's have a look at rounding then. You're used to mathematical rounding where, for example, if it's greater than five, or it's five and above, then you would round up to the next number, okay? So it's similar to truncation, but it tries to get a little bit closer to the original value. So this is the, you're used to it because you use it in mathematics, you use it in every life. But in binary, if the bit after the last bit to be represented is a one, then the previous bit is increased by one. So what do I mean? So for example, we just looked at this number here, okay? It would be stored as 0 0.011. So we're trying to chop here, right? Chop here. If this number is a 1, then you increase this to be a 1. And that's what it means. So it says, if the bit after the last bit to be represented, so that's the last bit to be represented, if that bit's a 1, then this is going to be a 1. Okay? If it's already a 1, you just leave it. If the relative error percentage is closer to zero, then it's more accurate. Yes, it is. If it's zero, it's very accurate because there's no error at all. No truncation error. I'll be very surprised if it did turn out as zero. But yeah. So our absolute error, which is our original number, which is this converted, minus our rounded number, which was this converted, gives us this crazy number here. Again, you'll have a calculating re exam. Please do take one. Um, I was in a mock exam the other day and I had four students that didn't take a calculator, the absolute lemons. Um, we did have them in the exam though, luckily enough. So the relative error, again, remember, relative error is absolute error divided by the original number, which is this one here. And that gives us 6.7%. What was the last one? Was it 28.9% or something? I can't remember now. Yeah, 28.9. So rounding, in this instance here, rounding is much more accurate. That's what we would go with in this instance. All right. Be careful because you might be asked to produce absolute and relative errors. Again, I'm sorry, there's no easy way to remember this. Again, you stick out a flashcard and practice some numbers. All right. So that's truncation and rounding. Shift functions, this again is something different in binary. Shift functions are split. So there's two types of shifting. You've got um, arithmetic and logical shifts. Okay, logical shifts, remember, just remember this, they replace bits with zero. Arithmetic bits once they're vacated, the vacated bit is replaced. Okay, that means nothing to you at this point. Absolutely nothing at all. But it will do in a second. Okay, so logical. Doesn't matter what you're moving in or out. It replaces the bit with zero. Arithmetic, the vacated bit is replaced with what was there before. So let's have a look then at an example. So this is logical shift. Let's start with that. A logical shift operation shifts each binary digit left or right, and the vacated bits are replaced with zeros. So you can shift all the digits left, or you can shift them all to the right. Okay, the following example performs a right logical shift. Now, if you if you don't know which way right is, then it's this way. And it's performing it on this binary number here. Okay, so let's put it in. Let's put it in a table. Okay, so here we are. So this is our original number: zero one. Uh, sorry, zero zero one, zero one zero one one. Okay, and that is the deanery value of forty three. You perform one logical shift to the right. So look what happens: you shift to the right because it's logical. The shift that you make, you push it down. You put zero in because it's logical. All right, this one bit that was here before goes here gets lost and if you look at the number 43 and 21 what's happened there it halves every time okay it halves every time obviously that's not a perfect halving because we're dealing with whole numbers okay but it tries to half every time then if you perform two right logical shifts it doesn't matter you put zero in again if you perform the left logical shift 
then you would put zero in here. Two left logical shifts, you'd add another zero in there. Okay? And that's it. Simple as that. Simple as that. So here's our left logical shift. Just to prove it, there you go. Look at what's happening now. If you left logical shift, you put zeros in again, and look at the numbers, it tries to double every time. I say that, it tries. So, just remember, logical shift, replace the vacated bits with zeros. Logical, replace with zeros. Arithmetic shifts. A little bit cleverer, cleverer. So these are our arithmetic shifts, right? And what they do, they're similar to logical shifts, okay, in the way they move bits up and down the register, but they can be distinguished by what happens to the bits that are shifted out of the register, okay? Now, we're replacing the bits with whatever was in there before. So when an arithmetic shift is performed to the right, the vacated bit is always replaced with the same value bit, okay? So look at this. In the following example, a right arithmetic shift is performed on the 2's complement binary number, which gives a negative denary value of 90. So that number there that we're using is in 2's complement. It's got the value of minus 90. All right. We perform one right arithmetic shift. So we shift it down. So that zero goes on here, gets lost. The one jumps in there, the one jumps in there, one jumps in there, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. Now, because this sign bit here was one before, we keep the same sign bit in there. And the reason we want to do this is because we want to preserve the sign bit. If we did a logical shift and replace this with zero, what's gonna happen? It's gonna change the number from a negative number to a positive number. That is a massive no-no. So we want to use arithmetic shifts, especially on negative two's complement numbers. That's why, again, arithmetic shifts are used over logical shifts normally. Okay? So arithmetic shifts are similar to logical shifts, but can be distinguished by what happens to the bits that are shifted out of the register at each end and what replaces the vacated bits. Arithmetic Bits preserve sign bits. When arithmetic shifts are performed to the right, the vacated bit is always replaced with the same bit. So what it's saying there is even if it's not a sign bit, okay, even if it's not a sign bit, we use the sign bit from whatever's there before, okay? So there's our right arithmetic shift. We just bring in whatever was there before. If we do a left arithmetic shift, look what happens this time. Because there was zero there before, we move it one down. We replace it with whatever was there before. So that's, again, zero. If there was a one there before, we'd put a one in there. Okay? And that's how logic, logical and arithmetic shifts work. Has anybody seen that before? Python 3.8.12. I'll try and recreate that. Arithmetic shifts. So if I ask you to go 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 2, 3, and 4, okay? If I asked you to perform a left arithmetic shift, shift by one what would happen to this number okay well if you shifted everything and moved it all the way down if i just draw a little table this is incredibly difficult you don't understand the level of skill required for this look at that look at that that's, a, that's incredible how does he do it so let's perform a shift to the left all right, fine. So let's put the zero. The zero goes left by one. Um, the one comes up here. That goes in there. 
this one goes in here, zero goes in here, one goes in here, one goes in here, one goes in here, one goes in here. You tell me what bit goes in there then. What bit is going to go in there with an arithmetic shift? Is it going to be, 50-50 chance here people, is it going to be a zero or is it going to be a one? That's just a circle by the way, that's not a zero, it's just a circle. What is it going to be? Arithmetic. Mm. Mateeb comes in and says a one. He is correct. Because the bit was one before, arithmetic shifts uh, maintain this. It's going to be a one now. Excellent. Yeah, perfect. Simple as that. Simple as that. If I went, okay. Oh, well, that, that, oh, that wasn't as good. Let's go one, zero, 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 one, zero. What are we on? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Okay, I want a shift. I want to shift two places to the left now. Two places to the left. So I go one, two. So that's one. The zero goes next, then I've got a zero, then I've got a zero, then I've got a one, then I've got a zero, then I've got a one. Okay, I've done that wrong already. I can tell. Zero, zero, one, zero, one. Yep, yeah, zero goes there. What goes in here? What goes in there? Two place arithmetic shift to the left. If we did one shift, we had one, we had zero in there before. What goes in this one then? So this one shifts across, that goes in there, and because it was zero, we also put zero in there. Okay, so all you got to do is look at the last bit really. Simple as that. You just got to remember. If that was logical, it would just be zero all the time. But arithmetic requires a little bit more thinking. All right? Now, have you heard these before? Underflow and overflow. When we're shifting to the left, we have this thing here. When it goes outside of the register bounds, we class this as overflow. Okay? If it goes the other way on a shift, if it goes this way, okay, then this goes outside the bounds. This is underflow, okay? Now, if it goes outside the bounds of the register, we just ignore it. And you're probably used to overflow and underflow because you've probably binary used binary addition before and added things together. Um, so it just, it just gets lost on the end or... Underflow is lower end of the register, um, overflow is the higher end of the register. Okay, let's tackle a question. I wonder how many people are still there. I wonder if, I'm, oh, I, don't, I know I'm not talking to myself. There's, there's a couple of people there. Right, here you go. What about this question? Uh, two, four, six, seven marks. <laughs> okay. So, I'm going to jump straight into this question. In a certain computer, integers are stored using sign and magnitude. Sign and magnitude is plus or minus in the most significant bit. Representation and 16-bit binary digits. The left-hand bit is set to zero for a positive number. Well, that's not zero, that most significant bit. That's a one, which means this is a negative number. One, two, four, eight. That is negative nine. Give yourself a mark, John. Way. Oh, man, I'm the best computer scientist in the world. That was well easy. <laughs> one mark for me. 
That was easy, wasn't it? So in another computer, integers are stored using two's complement representation. Explain, using an example, how the two's complement of binary is derived. Using an example. Using an example. Eh? Okay, I'll just make it just make an example. Does it tell me how many bits I need to use? No. Two's complement works in eight bits. So let's just make an eight bit number. One, two, four, eight, sixteen, thirty-two, sixty-four, one, twenty-eight. So I'll go uh I'm trying to think what a good example would be. Zero, one, one, zero, one, one, zero, zero. Okay. Um, two's complement representation explain using an example of how to use complement representation. Okay, so this here is a a number. And all I'm going to do is I'm going to say I need to show this in as, as an example. So what I'll do is I'll go from the right hand side. That's this bit here. Copy up to and including the first one bit. Okay, so I'll do that. I'll go zero, zero, one. Okay. Then invert the rest. Zero, zero, one, and then I've got zero, one, zero, zero, one, one, two, three, four, five, seven, eight. Yep. And that's it. Just try to think, because that was that was far that was just unbelievably easy. That's negative one twenty eight now. Okay, simple as that. You don't even have to represent what the number is, really. You can just do that. No problem whatsoever. Um, just trying to think. In another computer, real numbers are stored. So that's two marks for that. So I've explained all that there. In another computer, real numbers are stored in floating point using 20 bits. Oh man, 20 bits. Oh, dearie me, 20 bits. Jeez. Okay. Um, 16 bits for the Manchester. So you see all this stuff here. 16 bit in two's complement form. Ignore that. Ignore it. It's just there to scare you. The binary point in the Mantissa is in, yeah, we know that's that's the normalized point. Why are you telling me that? Go away. Stop, stop trying to scare me. Four bits. So I've got 16 bits and I've got four bits. Ignore the rest. Ignore the rest. Ignore it. Right, so 22.75. Remember the steps. Four steps, yeah? Step one, convert 22.75 in the smallest number of bits. One, two, four, eight, sixteen. So I'll take one of them. That'll be 24. Can't take that. I'll take 22. Nothing. Decimal point. Decimal point. 0 0.5. 0 0.25. One of them. And one of them. Do you agree that's 22.75? I agree. That's the smallest number of bits I could fit that into. So that gets you a mark already. Okay. Then what we do is we normalize. That's step two. Normalize by putting naught point at the front. Naught point. There you go. Bosh. Normalized. It's a tick, by the way. Then we pad to the right number of bits. So step three, pad it out from the right 
hand side. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen. Sixteen bits. Sixteen bits. Hey, done. Then work out how many places that decimal point needs to move from there to get to this one. That's one place, two place, three place, four place, five, five places, five places. I have four bits to represent five, the number five. So I'll just put this on the end. One, two, four, eight, it's in two's complement, so I'll put negative eight there. And I need to represent four. Oh, that was hard, wasn't it? There you go, there's four. And just because I've got an audience, I'll write this whole number out. One, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, zero, zero, one, zero. There you go. That's the full number for two marks. Easy peasy. Four steps. There you go. Carried out perfectly. Two marks in total. Now, in this one, if anyone's got questions, please do ask them. Um, I'm just moving through them how I would do it. Right, so evaluate the benefits and drawbacks of floating point form compared with integer form. Integer, just think, whole numbers. So the first thing, floating point. You'll have a greater, a greater range. Because you've got minuses as well, haven't you? Uh, sorry, floating point numbers. So greater range, more accuracy. So greater range. Oh. Greater range. And also, um, that'll include positive and negative. Pos and negative. Much better range. And that all can be stored in the same number of bits. Same number of bits. Um, when we normalise a binary number, we're moving the decimal point at the front, i.e. pretending not point. So how does the computer know where the decimal point in the number is? That's the reason why we put it there in the first place. Isn't it five? Did I do five? Or have I done it wrong? Someone's corrected me. What's gone on? How many places did it? It was five. Naughty, naughty. There you go. Thank you very much, people. See, that could have lost me a mark, that. Stupid, John. Not so simple. Ah. Ah. Ugh. Look at that. You know what? I'll go back and edit this. I never made a mistake. I didn't make a mistake. Um, yeah, so the computer knows not point because that it's written into the, the algorithm that, that works out numbers. So when you go down to the... Um, accumulator in your processor the algorithm's written in to check floating point numbers at naught point all all computer scientists agreed the founding fathers of the, of the cpu agreed that that's where it would be yeah look at that well, well the chat's never been so lit has it but there we are yeah i made a mistake never mind okay um Let's think about, I'm trying to think of some really, some good ones. Now, the negative to this, the drawback of floating point form, so that's a positive, isn't it? A negative would be um, floating point numbers. Floating point numbers are not always stored accurately yep no exact represent yeah now the reason why i'm saying that is because of the question i had before about that python thing. if you look at the chat the question i had before about that python problem for for example if it was an integer it would just store seven as seven wouldn't it but in floating point form you would have to store it 
and it would have to have some kind of storage involved in it. So it could even be something like simple as that, because it has to end the number. That's a weird problem. And that also it leads to another problem where it it requires more complex processing. Think about it. I've just done all that mantis and exponent stuff. That required a lot more processing of my brain and also of the computer. More complex processing. And you've got the, the, the one I said before that was said in the chat was um, you can have a positive zero and a minus, a negative zero. So you've got two representations. Take your pick. This is the one I normally see in exams because it's easy to remember that. Okay. Does anybody want any more binary questions? When the number is greater than 2 to the power of 53, it loses the accuracy when it's stored due to the overflow errors, I assume. Yeah, I would say so. That's going to cause overflow errors. That, that number can't be stored correctly in, in a standard register. Oh yeah, big, big, big int. Arithmetic shifts. Okay. Um, all right, there we go. It's like I had that prepared. Arithmetic shifts. So calculate the effect of carrying out an arithmetic shift left by two places on the 8-bit positive integer 00001111 and state the effect of this operation on the number. Okay? So, let's just put this over here. So it's four zeros and four ones. Zero, 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 one, two, three, four. Okay. So now, the number becomes, the number becomes, what we're doing, two, we're doing two, two left places. So that goes, Chop, I'm going to chop them two off. It's going to be zero, zero, one, two, three, four. And what's it going to be on the end? Hmm. Left two place take the effect. Uh, arithmetic shift. Well, that would be two, two, three, four. Interesting. Okay. All right. I think the vacated bits would be. The vacated bits would be one. So I'm just thinking out loud. Because we've gone left, haven't we? Left two places. Now I got that because I got that because you would chop them off and then you would add in the ones down here. So what's going to happen is you are going to, if you shift left, what's going to happen to the positive 8-bit number is that you are going to double and then double again. That's what I believe. If the arithmetic shift left by two places was carried out.
And then for the second one, if an arithmetic shift left by two places was carried out on an 8-bit register containing the positive integer, um, on this one, a problem would arise. Describe the problem and how it could be rectified. So the question just I just got there was, why do you have to add ones on the left hand side? Because it's an arithmetic shift, whatever you move out of this bit here, because you're doing the left shift and this bit here, you replace like for like. So here, if this was my register, let me do that again. Actually, let me show you again. I'll try and draw my fancy 8-bit table. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Okay, so I'm going to left shift this once. So if I left shift it once, that's going to go there. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, and four. Because this was a one in an arithmetic shift, one gets replaced in there. Okay. And then if I do that again, and I left shift it again, hopefully this is a better uh, drawing, you can understand it a little bit better. That's going to go there now, so you've got zero, zero, and then you've got zero there, one, two, three, four, five, because that's a one. One's been replaced there. Okay. Anyone got any questions about that? Yeah. So when the um, the number the number actually doubles every time. Remember when we're doing shifts. So when it says state the effect this has on the operation of the number, um, it's going to try it's going to try and double it once. It's going to try and double it again. Now this one, if an arithmetic shift uh, left by two places was carried out on an 8-bit register containing the positive integer 0, 1, 0, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. Ugh. Wow, I do apologise, that was awful. I've lost my skill. What's going to happen here? We've got left, uh, arithmetic shift left again. So let me do one shift, zero, one, zero, zero, one, two, three, four. One was taken out, so one gets put back in because it's like for like. That's one shift. We go again, one, zero, zero, one, 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 one. One was taken out, one's back in. So what's happened now? What has happened now? So we've got an overspill and the number has actually changed because we've overflowed a one bit. Overflowing zero bits is absolutely fine, no problems really, because yeah, that's okay. But we're actually losing the size of the number. So what we need, what we need to do, how this problem could be rectified, if we're losing digits and we don't want to lose digits, then simply to get a mark, you would say that more digits are required. You would have a bigger register. That's what you would say. Okay. If you wanted another mark, you could say, well, you'd report an error. Because you've actually changed the accuracy of the number.
So that's the consideration that you need to think about. Okay. So in this one, explain using an example why hexadecimal is often used to represent binary, uh, binary numbers. So think about it. It's just because X is easier to read. And I could do, um, probably for a second mark there, I imagine you would give an example like that. 2AD. Um, or, I don't know why I give myself such a difficult example. You could say FF, 1, 2, 3, 4, 1, 2, 3, 4. It's like, what? 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 This is much easier to read than this. Takes up less storage. Well, remember, it's still going to have to be expanded, isn't it? You'd have to be really explicit and explain why it takes up less storage. But this is talking um, about why is it why is it being used to represent binary numbers? Yeah, that's what I mean. That's okay as long as you actually explain that explicitly. Okay. Now there are loads more, loads more questions. So if people do want to. Uh, Ask those, look at all these questions I've, I've got for you with binary, but I think we need to move on. We've now been going, what, six, seven, eight, two hours so far. Two hours. I wonder how many people. I'm just going to check how many people are still hanging on. Just, just uh, let me check that. Oh, there's still some people. I'm surprised. Well done. Look at these. Right. Let's crack on. Principles of programming. So I'm going to fly through these now. Now, principles of programming, uh, not principles of programming, what I'm talking about. I'm talking about algorithms and programs. We've got parameters and programming constructs. So this really will be taught by your programming teacher. So teacher two, I call them, all right? So parameters are used to pass values into subroutines. Subroutines are things like um, procedures, And you've got subroutines that are functions as well. Functions return values. Procedures do not. Parameter passing is usually used instead of using global variables. We want to try and limit the amount of global variables because it's bad for memory. It's bad for storage. Um, and, and it's also a security risk. So there are two methods of parameter passing. The first one is what we call by reference. So you can pass a parameter. If you ever wanted to spot up a parameter, by the way, you, you might have something like um, calc, VAT, bracket, bracket, total, like that, right? That thing inside the brackets is a parameter. So if you ever need to spot one, just find a func find function, find a, a procedure, and spot what the parameter is, okay? So if you pass that parameter by reference, then you're actually sending a copy of the memory address of where that variable lives. And that means it can be changed. So in your exam question, two things that you need to, you need to say in order to get marks, you pass the memory address. And that means it can be changed. Okay? And it changes in its original location. Sometimes that is really bad. You do not want to do that. The default standard now is that you pass by value. And when you pass by value, you send a copy of the data. And that's what you need to write in your exam. You pass a copy of the data into the procedure and it cannot be altered. So they're the two things that you need to say in your exam. A copy of the data and it cannot be altered. And that is fantastic because you want to try and avoid unwanted side effects of people accidentally or on purpose editing that variable. Okay. And you've got, there, there's an example, calculate VAT. It's what I did up there. I just put total. They put amount. No problem. And if we look at a question like this, it says, explain 
why it's good programming practice to use constants, okay? Quick recap here. Um, constants, what could they be throughout the life of the program? Constants, again, well, let's VAT, pi, they don't change throughout the life of the program. Constants cannot change while the program is running. They get set once and they can be used many times throughout the program, no problem. Um, meaningful names. Meaningful names are also referred to as self-documenting identifiers. You heard of those before? Self-documenting identifiers. It's just easy to understand, isn't it? Easier for people to understand and read code. Yep, they are consistent. Well done. Almost static. And then you've got explain the difference between a value and reference parameter, giving an advantage of using a value parameter. Okay. Now in here, oh, it says from the algorithm, identify a value and reference parameter. So remember, values are copy. Reference is actually changing. So for example, here's a constant. This is pi. That's our constant. Um, start procedure, set A. Now, R and A, these two, remember the, remember the procedure? Declare sub-procedure, find area. So I'll label this for you. This is a procedure. These are parameters inside the brackets. R and A. Okay, so when A gets passed into here, you are assigning it the value of pi multiplied by R, which comes from there. And R comes from there. So what you're doing is you are assigning a value. So if you are changing A and putting the result in A, that means you're changing A and A is therefore the reference parameter. The value parameter is R because it's only being used. It's not being changed. We seem to have some buffering issues. Hopefully it'll kick in soon. I'll just pause for a minute. Hey, that Ethernet cable is solid as a rock. We're good. just can't handle all this content that's what's going on it's just too powerful for it. it's just too much data oh. data rate seems fine 